In an article published in 2012 on the EFLEX journal, the Slovenian philosopher Mladen Dollar opens his discussion on the Lacanian psychoanalysis uh, numerology between the one and the two with what he calls a Maoist slogan from the 1960s. Also the title of the article, One Divides into Two. He laments that not only does the slogan sound dated today, but also that student nowadays won't understand it. I quote, none will have ever heard it or have any link inkling as to its bearing and its author. It's almost like speaking Chinese, end of quote. It's almost like speaking Chinese. My, Im my immediate reaction as a Chinese speaker was not only one raised eyebrow, but in fact two. How can one in 2012 still make such a stupid joke? In the same paragraph, the author invokes an infamous debate of the early Communist Party of China while using an age-old colonial trope of the inscrutable Chinese as his comic relief. While it has become repetitive, flattened, and almost dogmatic, the critique of Orientalism in the humanities, its critical premise and the political necessity seem to be strongly, still strongly held. But let me analyze a little bit uh, my reaction first. Why was I particularly shocked by the joke? Because it was made in 2012. To emphasize that the Maoist slogan allegedly sounded dated and foreign to his young students. In a nutshell, the Chinese language, one used by one sixth of the world's population and widely studied across the globe, was invoked through its alleged unintelligibility to illustrate the slogan's temporal backwardness and spatial foreignness of a political philosophical speculation that the author set to continue with a Lacanian solution. Would I have the same reaction if it were an article from the 1932, why I would no longer feel personally offended watching a film about the Fu Manchu in 1932, or reading a book of the 1965, this seemingly unimportant detail of a 2012 essay did make me feel unease to the extent that I decided to dig deeper into what was going on there today together with you. My double standard towards 2012 and 1932 seems to suggest that racism, or for that matter, sexism, or any kind, let's call it structural prejudice, have an expiry date. I thought we have been all over with the Chinese question. I thought by now China has been largely reported, analyzed, and critiqued as a global power rather than a victim of European colonialism. The idea of the inscrutable Orient would have already become history. Surely, I'm trapped in a teleological idea of history's linear progress and progression. I'm lured into believing it gets better. Tom Ansom and the team have put up a fabulous exhibition to scramble this linear idea of history, as well as the purity of the European avant-garde to alert us to the fact that something persists, something looks stunningly similar, almost a century later. In the disbelief similar to my reaction to the appearance of a racist joke in a progressive critical journal, we are suddenly caught into the turmoil of crisis, when the specter of fascism has turned spectacular in recent years with Donald Trump's election, the recent Israeli massacre of Palestinians in Gaza, and I don't even need to say the FDs entry into the German parliament. Let me take the inscrutable Chinese as the placeholder for the inscrutable other, the primitive, the barbarian, the refugee, you, want, uh, you name it, and the continue, that continue to haunt the Eurocentric. It does not have an expiry date. It is structural, it is a structural node of ethnocentrism, of the very historiography in which the story of thinking has been told and retold. In fact, already in the 30s, Carl Einstein has made his attempt to resolve it through the figure of the SO function. My own thinking within young transdualism resonates strongly with it, that is, to get into the core of dualistic thinking. 
But this is clearly something that will take me another 30 years, so stay tuned. One of the persistent trope in the colonial masculinist psyche is what I call the denial of pervasion. It can be traced to the theopolitical orthodoxy of creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothingness. He posits his own being as exempted from the help and the influence of and from the others, let alone his own vulnerability and the penetrability. I have shown the persistence of creatio ex nihilo in the colonial imaginary resurgent in its justification of colonial conquest, ethnic cleansing, and cultural imperialism through an inquiry of the modern colonial reception of the Babylonian and Aztec creation myths in my book, um, Queer Ancient Ways, that is forthcoming. The project resonates very much with the spirit of the 1930s, uh, to my great uh, <laughs> surprise, almost a kind of anachronistic mystical encounter, and I also saw a title in the vitrine, uh, L'Experience Mythique. I saw at the very beginning of the exhibition, as in section A, all the themes I touched upon in queer ancient ways are sitting next to each other, the Aztec, the Mexico, the Babylonian, and the Chinese. When Tom called me to participate in this marvelous event to talk about transdualism, a concept I've recently developed through a decolonial and distraitant reading of Yin Yang, I was wondering why. I'm no historian of art, much less of Karl Einstein. My doubts seemed unnecessary after seeing the exhibition. The decolonial queer methodology I've developed in the past few years since my first book resonates strongly with the concerns and methods of the 30s. It looks into ancient arts, literature, and philosophies, and the even older primordial time in memorial these images and texts invoke, and takes them as theoretical re resources for rethinking contemporary questions of gender sexuality, cosmopolitan entanglement, and the political emancipation. I start to look at some instance when Yin Yang, the focal point of my theorization of transdualism, appear in European intellectual history. Two very important works on Chinese philosophy appeared around precisely the period of 1930. German theologian and sinologist Richard Wilhelm's translation of Chinese philosophy's Canon of Canon uh, appeared in 1924 as Yin Yang das Buch der Wanderlungen, and the French sociologist Marcel Canet's 1934 monograph La Pensée Chinoise. Shall we categorize them in the same endeavor to look at the Neolithic childhood is a question that I will leave for our historians to answer. My task today is first to introduce the Yin Yang uh, transdualism, and then we will look at specifically how Yin Yang transdualism posits a critique of the logic of either or, spatially, and successionism temporally in the context of contemporary debate around the so-called post-colonial totality. And at the last bit of the talk, we will briefly fly back to the 30s and revisit the deezing trafficking of ideas across the globe as a dissented historiography of pervasion. Now, let us ask a question regarding Yin Yang. What is Yin Yang? Shorthand explanation often goes to explain Yin and Yang as woman and man and all the other dualistic pairs, such as the one from uh, Jacques, uh, Jacques Lacan's semin semin Seminaire, Je ne parle pas du yin et du yang, comme tout le monde, vous savez cela, le mal et le femelle, the, man, the, the male and the female. Mladen Dollar quoted earlier, although seems Chinese to be incomprehensible, nevertheless spent a long paragraph explaining yin yang as, I quote, two and only two poles of masculine and feminine, end of quote. He concludes from the Taoist symbol, a strong thesis, I quote, there is a relation, there is a sexual relation. Every relation is sexual, end of quote. If you are familiar with Lacanian psychoanalysis, this sentence would sound familiar as Lacan has famously said the opposite, il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel. Indeed, this paragraph on yin yang is set as a counterexample of Lacanian take on sexual difference in uh, Dollar's work. Uh, I'm not going there, so uh, 
relax. And um, it is via Lacan's 1933 seminar, the only source ever cited by Dollar when talking confidently about the Taoist yin yang symbol. He claims that, I quote, Aristotelian ontology is like our Western version of yin yang. It takes analogous assumption about hila and morphe, matter and form, the feminine and the masculine, end of quote. Even though the long history of masculine domination and pervasive heteronormativity in China does help but to confirm this kind of reductive re reading of yin yang as a hierarchical sexual dualism, I cannot help but think that yin yang has been crudely colonized in 2012. It has been reduced to an a historical concept whose prehistoric origin in mythology of Fuxi Nuwa in the 20th century BC, the warring state instantiation in I Ching in the 5th century BC, Taoist modification, Confucius ad adaptation from the Taoist in Zhou dynasty around the 5th to the 2nd century BC. Further, its stratification, moralization, and I add heteronormativization in cosmological Confucianism, notably by Dong Zhongshu in Han Dynasty around the first and second century BC, and further to resurgent in philosophical treaties of the Neo-Confucians of Song Dynasty, notably Zhou Dunyi and Zhu Xi in the 11th and 12th century. To name but a only a span of 3,000 years of dramatic changes, which are unambiguously lumped into one single uncomplete uncomplicated example, illustrated by an image taken from a New Age website. I don't know how to say that um, name. Uh, I will focus on the formative period, so the period before uh, uh, the, the Yin Yang concepts uh, stratification in Han, Dyn Han Dynasty by Dong Zhongshu. So the short capitulation Yin and Yang, or more Yin Yang written together, showing an unconventional order of words, perhaps already hints at something different. The masculine habit of appearing first is at least reversed on the lexical level. Since one would never say yang ying or yang and ying, one might at least pause for a moment before running into saying yin yang, turning yin yang into another symbol of the myth of a cross-cultural, universal, and a historical patriarchy. Etymologically, yin means the northern shadow side of the mountain and yang the southern side. So the second century dictionary, Shuo Wen Jiezi has it, uh, yin shui zhi nan shan zhi bei ye, yang gao ming ye. Um, the German sinologist Richard Wilhelm, writing in the summer of 1923 in Beijing, went even deeper into the etymology. So yin is vorkig, trübe, Yang is in the Sonne behind Banner, also etwas beleuchtetes Helles, which is uh, translated in the, in the slide. That is to say, yin yang in its etymological meaning has nothing to do with sexual differences. Even with the Confucian philosopher Dong Zhongshu's uh, hier hierarchization of yin yang in the second century BC, sexual differences are only one aspect, albeit important, of yin yang's mirrored manifestation in the world, not its essence. In Alenka Tsupanchish's sexual difference and ontology, yin yang is also lumped together with other traditional ontology and traditional cosmologies, said to be a, quote, strongly reliant on often explicitly sexualized opposition, end of quote. In his eagerness to prove the uniqueness of Hegel's dual di dialectics, Slavoj Žižek in several instances relegates yin yang to an all-encompassing premodern notion. While according to him is, I quote, composed of two opposite forces and principles which have to be kept in balance, end of quote. I have only given you examples from scholarship, but singing yin yang as sexual difference, or more precisely, a coital harmony with Eastern wisdom, um, is omnipresent. Um, for example, in self-cultivation sexual manuals, massage oil, or herbal tea that balance your mind and soul. Uh, and then body, sorry. Um, of course, none of the above mentioned 
thinkers who simplify yin yang as another traditional or primitive dualistic notion are sinologists. One can hardly require them to consult Tao Te Ching or the I Ching, which they haven't. We might expect, however, a little bit of research into the rich tradition of European sinology, however orientalist as a dis discipline it could be criticized of. If one were to touch upon, let alone criticize, one of the most fundamental concepts of Chinese philosophy. In fact, Richard uh, Wilhelm in 1923, introduction to the German translation of Yi Ching, which has been later translated into many different languages, could be used uh, anachronistically as an astute critique of the kind of reductionism. The quotation is there. Similarly, in his influential book, La Pensée Chinoise, French sinologist Marcel Carnet asserts his elaborated explanation of yin yang against a tendency of qualifier ces symboles chinois en empruntant des termes de langue définis de philosophie d'Occitan. Tirant argument de leur définition, il prétend à la pensée chinoise une tendance vers un dualisme substantialiste. More specifically, already in 1934, he urged Zizek and the like to note, I quote, rien d'envie d'avoir dans le yin et le yang des substances, des forces, des principes. In fact, the two contradictory propensities are constantly in the process of becoming each other, like day and night, light and shadow. This interbecoming does not really allow a clear differentiation and demarcation. There are not two ontologically separated entity or forces that would be joined together with an end. The Confucian commentary on the I Ching states, Yi Ying Yi Yang Wei Zhi Dao. Dao De Jing has it, Wan Wu Fu Ying Er Bao Yang. So the first one and the second one. In order to tease out the complex yin-yang relationality and to avoid the misapprehension of yin-yang as a sort of ontology of sexual difference or of any ontology at all, it is important to stress, maybe through a violation of the English grammar, yin-yang, yin and yang are either mutually restraining and mutually generative. As it is stated in the beginning of Tao Te Ching, these two, they come from the same place, but bear different names. What's more, these two are a process with four stages in accordance with the seasonal changes of spring, summer, autumn, winter. Huang Di Neijing, or the Yellow Empress in the canon, uh, or more specifically in the Treaty of the Code Injury by Zhang Zhongjing, elaborates in details. So you see all the six stages of uh, Yin Yang. We could summarize dualistic thinking spatially in terms of either or, and temporally in terms of secessionism, before and after. The production of turns, the linguistic turn, the visual turn, the affective turn, the ecological turn, the ontology, ontological turn and the decolonial turn. Transdualism attempts to critique dualism without reproducing a dualistic model of either or, one that pretends to move beyond, to overcome or to overthrow dualism, but always locked in a temporal successionism within a similarly linear Euro-American centric genealogy. I want to use transdualism as a critique that moves below the logic of successionist either or, and may be captured with the pairing either and. Either marks the distinct identities, qualities, and tendencies in time and space, and marks their dependency and entanglement, their propensity for running into and becoming each other, which therefore renders the distinct identities frangible and evanescent. Kane elaborates uh, his theory that Yin Yang points to aspects or what he calls emblem rather than forces or principles through an attention to the entanglement of time and space by rendering the Confucian commentary of the Yi Jing, Yi Yin Yi Yang Wei Zhi Dao as Ang Dang Yin, Ang Dang Yang, 
and this, at the same time, on Godé Yin and Godé Yang, c'est là le Tao. He contends rightly that to understand these time-space entanglement, one needs to remember, I quote, ce mot, ce Tao, signale une notion apparentée aux idées de I, mutation, de bien, changement clinique, cyclique, de ton, interpénétration mutuelle. End of quote. I is part of the title of I Ching, the same difference interbecoming of yin yang and the unchanging changing Tao has been e e explored in the in the in the title itself. Uh, I Ching so can be uh, more accurately translated as the unchangeable script of changeability and non-changing. Trans in transdualism primarily follows the m multiple meaning of yi. So the uh, connoting effortless, uh, or what uh, François Julien would call it uh, transformation silencieuse, the silent transformation, changeability and uh, invariability. What remains less elaborated, uh, but more intriguing and important aspect for which I bring in young transdualism to our discussion today here is the idea of ton, translated by Carnet as in mutual interpenetration, the notion of tone is passive and active, penetrating and pervading. In fact, it is an ideal status of things. As the saying goes, one, when one is tone, when one is unblocked, one does not feel pain. When one feels pain, it is because one is blocked. Now, let me step into some hot polemics that I don't necessarily want to be involved, but since it is an excellent example of how the denial of pervasion of obstruction, or shall we simply call it fortress Europe, look like, and how transdualism or SO function, for that matter, would tell us a history and therefore future otherwise. So I would step into it for a moment. And um, in the past days, I was thinking that it's also a kind of easy, easy target. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's see it. In his defense uh, of uh, Slavo Zizek's extremely problematic notion of critical Eurocentrism, Ilan Kapoor recently argues against his critiques, notably the decolonial theorists such as Walter Mignolo and Hamid Tabashi, to, I quote, equate non-European particularity with a certain authenticity, as though a distinct or pristine non-European identity can be retrieved in the wake of colonialism and globalization of capital, end of quote. Sounds familiar? Yes, there's nothing outside of Euro modernity. The theory of a Eurocentric totality escalate and seems out of hand. Now one page later, our author claims, I quote, implicit in Zizek's argument is that in the wake of European imperial domination, the European symbolic order is the de facto global symbolic order so that the post-colonial subject in the global north, as much as the south, has no choice but to work with it." End of quote. For anyone who, a, who has actually worked with non-European cultures, or for that matter, non-modern European ones, this extremely confident argument can be easily scotched. Jose Rabasa, investigating the survival and the persistence of indigenous Aztec Nahua culture in Mexico by pondering what he calls the elsewhere, the radical elsewhere embedded in the post-conquest codex painted by the trilingual Tlaquilos, so the scriptures, does not even deem it necessary to state the obvious in the main text, but in the footnote, I quote. The elsewhere we intuit in folio 46 of the codex de Teieriano Remesis, disrupts the assurance that the invasion of the West has imposed a singular world and history." End of quote. The actual work of studying the other is one thing that one can, we cannot expect from everyone. The actual work of know, knowing one's own history is another, one that is a mandate of any responsible scholarship. The argument of the inescapable European symbolic totality, for example, is allegedly supported by Franz Fanon. The Slovene philosopher, in his response to Walter Mignolo's invocation of Fanon, 
points out, I quote, Fanon has dealt intensively with Hegel, psychoanalysis, Sartre, even Lacan, end of quote. Fanon, therefore, might well be a critical Eurocentric, as Zizek himself and his defenders of this oxymoron would be. This is, of course, only attainable if we were to deny the influence of Haitian revolution on Hegel, as Susan Buckmore has shown, Algerian anti-colonial struggle on Sartre, the non-European, particularly the Egyptian Moses in Freud, as Edward Said has famously shown, and Taoism and Monsieurs on Lacan, who in, in his uh, 18th seminar, one that draws extensively on Chinese philosophy and writing, admits, but that je ne suis lacanien que parce que je fais du chinois autrefois. Ilan Kapoor's argument that, I quote, the Western legacy may well be and is indeed imperialist domination and plunder applied, as applied by the very standard by which it and its critiques measures its own critical past, end of quote, echoes with, one, with some critical discourse that busily denies either any decolonial attempts as nativism or nostalgia nostalgia of an imaginary past. Eurocentrism, including the critical ones, is soaked in the denial of privation. Denial of privation together with denial of co-evilness co -e uh, is the Eurocentric response to what they deem as European legacy on the one hand, and on the other hand, the inscrutable Chinese. If one were to agree with the theory of post-colonial totality, indeed one of pervasion, albeit the undesirable kind called colonial imposition, we need to fundamentally debunk the very idea that Europe has created itself ex nihilo, that European thinkers like Hegel, Sartre, Freud, Lacan, and so on, just miraculously created emancipatory theory as if from nothingness. Now, let's return again to the notion of tone. Let's call it the SO function of transdualism, which both the concept of tone and Kai Einstein's formulation points to. That is interpenetration. Since penetration is too violent, too phallic, too colonial, let us think of tone as pervasion. The SO function of transdualism has not abandoned the S, the O, or the dual, the yin and the yang, that is to say, differences per se are not the problem. Not only that, but also difference is what enables the transient moment and the porous pervasive pervasion. The SO transdualism relies on the entangled differences and distinguishable sameness of yin yang. It regards dualistic pairs as operative in the imminent making sense of the world while at the same time it highlights the queerly transformative propensities of yin-yang in a way that keeps yin and yang both distinctly different and porously one. While European artists and intellectuals, now I quote from the exhibition text, in search of new beginnings, a new critical awareness manifests itself in a resource to all things archaic to deep, to deep time and to notions of humanity's childhood, end of quote, other global cities such as Shanghai was busy constructing their visions of modernity as a response to the deepened crisis of the young republic. Mm -hmm. The left-wing writer league, which includes renowned writers such as Lu Xun, Ding Ling, Xiao Hong, and Yu Dafu, was busy reinventing Chinese writing experimenting with cosmopolitanism, advocating feminism and new forms of sexualities. Meanwhile, the Bengali poet Tagore influenced the Crescent Moon Society with members such as poet Xu Zhimo, Hu Shi, and Shen Zongwen, forming part of the new cultural movement in China. Shi Zetun uh, founded the art and literary journal Xian Dai, Li Gong Dan Bohan, with an explicit editorial policy to uh, dis distance itself from any single political or artistic movement. In an academic workshop uh, of uh, the recent project, A Revisit to Chinese Modernism, held at Taikang Space in Beijing last year, 
Art critic Dong Bingfeng identifies the 30s and specifically this journal, Xiandai, as the first period of Chinese modernism and argues against a univocal narrative of Chinese modernism as a result of translation, colonialism, or capitalist economy. The narrow perspective that sees modernism as only moving from the West to the rest is contested also by examples such as Eisenstein. We don't need to stress how much he is indebted to Mexico, and I will not open the box called Mexico that will conjure up another set of interconnections and traffickings of ideas that will keep us here for another 10 hours. I just want to mention a lesser known aspect of his uh, filmmaking. The inspiration he got from Chinese opera and Japanese kabuki, in, in particular the, the Peking opera diva King Mei Lanfang, who looked back in time and researched into ancient Chinese stagecraft, and according to Eisenstein, I quote from Eisenstein, had restored the actor's skill to its formal symbolic quality, a synthetic quality, end of quote. On the other side of the strait, in Taiwan, which was under the colonial rule of Japan, a surrealist society was formed by the name of Le Moulin, French, of course, with avid readers of André Bredon and Jean Cocteau, Huang Yali, the Taiwanese director, made an impressive movie last year about the, the poet society in the 30s called Le Moulin. Huang answered the question of why surrealism. The translation is there. Although超现实主义要被引号起来, we will have a chance to see this film uh, later this year in December uh, of an uh, event I am curating together with my colleagues of the Minor Cosmopolitanisms events, uh, which will take place here and from 6th to 8th um, December. Um, so putting scare quote around either the so-called primitivism or ultra-modern surrealism is one of the ways in which a decolonized historiography I have been trying to lay out here. The anxious, crisis-ridden, yet exciting, widely circulating, global, cosmopolitan, and trans-historical nature of the avant-garde, from Tokyo to Taipei, Mexico City to Moscow, to Paris to Shanghai, in the 1930s reflects nothing but the messiness of any cultural formation. That deezing, back and forth processes of mutual influence, interpenetration indeed, the wide borrowing from different time and space from the, primi prim from the primitive of the future and the surrealist of the past. And, but, this is a big but, these influences and the interpenetration could not and did not lead to an annihilation of difference. This is what colonialism does and or at least attempts to do nor a single story of European legacy. This is what defenders of colonialism and the Eurocentrism do. Nor a global village of homogenized consumers. This is why neoliberalism is fast in teaching Chinese wisdom in business schools, including the repeatedly reminding phrase to managers to be that crisis in Chinese means both crisis and opportunity. Jose Rabasa again, I quote, in the same way that Euro Europe remained Europe after the incorporation of Mesoamerican chocolate, cacao, but also the concept of the noble savage, cannibalism, whiteness, New World America into its system of thought and everyday life, Mesoamerica remains Mesoamerica after the incorporation of European life form. The process of, of the process of appropriation, expropriation, and exappropriation involves a two-way street. End of quote. This is, of course, not to plea, pl not pledge for maintaining borders, our way of life. On the contrary, their distinctive identities can only be attained through the messy entanglement with each other. Not a two-way, but an intersectional street. To the dismay of the AFD and the like, border, if necessary at all, could only work when it is open. We don't need to enumerate in this particular city examples after examples of the painful consequences of obstruction. 
They have proven again and again the old saying to be true. When blocked, it is painful. But I would want to add a little bit outside of the, 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 the paper that from today's experience, some certain temporal obstruction is necessary. Let me and end today's reflection with another racist joke. Now, not the inscrutable Chinese. That joke doesn't work and has never worked since there's nothing inscrutable if one takes the time to study any foreign language. The game is called the Chinese Whisper, the Stille Post in German. Right? Despite its shared origin in the idea of the inscrutable Chinese, the game itself shows the defining feature of any form of cultural intra-action and translation. If many of the studies in vocation and borrowing from the non-West in the 30s, before and beyond, have been a kind of Chinese whisper, let us not forget one thing that is the rule of the game. Words passed from mouth to ear, orifice to orifice, unblocked. I Ching, the uns unchangeable script of the changing, reads the great stability, also translated as uh, the, the great harmony, hexagram Tai, as heaven and earth interact perfectly and the myriad things communicate without obstacle. Or, as Peba Marcos in Armodova's 30 years old classic Mujeres a Borde de un Ataque de Nervios puts it right before her recipe for gazpacho was maintenanced by two guns. Here it only shows one. El secreto está en mezclarlo bien. The secret lies in mixing it well. Thank you.